Good afternoon. Um, wanted to just uh, welcome everyone to our webinar today, uh, Curing Common Pest Problems, How to Protect Your Practice from Bed Bugs, Flies, and Other Pests. Um, I'm kind of going to get rid of some housekeeping things here initially. Uh, so just uh, we're, we're going to give a, a few of those stragglers that these last 30 seconds to just uh, chime on in and then we'll get going. <clears throat> um, it is important to remember that this, this is for a, uh, a PACOM CEU approved broadcast. Uh, it is credited for one training hour, one continuing education unit. Uh, after the webinar, about one hour after the webinar, uh, we will email out the index number. So we will, uh, an hour after the webinar ends, we'll, we'll email out the index number to all attendees. And, and that index number is all you will need to submit when, you, when you're actually due to submit your CEUs uh, for, for Paycom. Um, the webinar will also be available through the Paycom YouTube channel in, in the very near future. And, and I believe a, a note will, will come out to, to any attendees uh, when, that, when that time or when that webinar is actually available. So, so with that, um, once again, curing common pest problems, uh, protecting your practice from bed bugs, flies, and other pests. I'm Dr. Tim Husen. One second. Oh, there I am. I'm the presenter today. I'm a board certified entomologist. I've been uh, studying entomology, uh, you know, just in general, killing bugs, pests, and, and protecting the environment for about 17 years now. I'm a technical services manager here with Orkin Corporate. I support the entire country of, of Orkin's operations and help them make the best technical decisions and use the best products and equipment uh, you know, to, to make sure we're solving all your problems in the quickest and best way and safest way possible. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, first things first, we're going to stress why pest management matters, specifically in your healthcare office setting. Uh, what, then we're going to talk about what is IPM. I'm sure some of us on the, on the webinar today know what IPM is, and, and hopefully this will be a good refresher for you on what that is. And then anybody that doesn't know, uh, it's an excellent opportunity to learn about it. Then we're going to talk about some very specific pests that you may encounter in your office environment and, and what hot spots they're going to be found in. And then, you know, what are some symptoms or, or how will you know they're there? Uh, we'll discuss solutions for controlling these things big picture. How do we prevent them from coming back? And then we'll touch upon some of the documentation that if you already have us as your service provider, your pest control service provider uh, should already be covered for you. And then if, if, if you have another current provider, you know, what documentation should you be stressing that you have to take care of, you know, your guys in the, on that office setting of if, you're, if you have audits coming up or, or anything like that. And then I'll follow up with some questions and answers. Um, if anybody has questions, there's a chat feature in, in the GoToWebinar panel there. Please chat those in and I'll open that up at the end of the, at end of the webinar and we'll cover as many of those as we possibly can for you. And, and if I can't get through them all in the, in the allotted time we have, I will uh, try to answer those. And, and I believe we have email for every attendee, so I will, I will be able to answer those and, and we can email you, a, you know, a, an answer to your question, hopefully sometime after the webinar ends. So why does pest management matter? Um, pest management matters for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one and of utmost importance, is patient safety and care. And, and even when you're talking about patients, you could think of your employees as our patients. We, we, take, you know, we take environmental health and protecting health both of humans and, and the environment of, of utmost importance. Um, and, and pests and, and having pests in an area, oftentimes pests can, can bring disease or can, can contaminate surfaces with you know, uh, pathogens or, or, or things of that nature. Or, or just generally, you know, seeing a mouse or, or, or seeing a bed bug uh, actually just deters people from wanting to go there or doesn't make them feel very safe. Um, you know, pest, or health, health office centers have, an, have everything that pests need. There, there's three things all pests are going to need to survive. That's going to be food, water, and shelter. So somewhere in your office environment, 
There's all three of those things that will provide everything a pest needs. A pest needs to survive, and and it's somewhere where you know folks get caught in the, your your employees will get caught in the ho hum day to day, and they aren't actually seeing these conditions that will help lead these pests. That's why pest management and having a pest management provider uh, is of utmost importance because we're the ones that would come in and notice these things popping up. You know, so if if there is a if there is food or if there's a, a moisture issue or a, a water leak somewhere, we're the ones that might notice it, and we can pinpoint it faster and notify your folks and your facilities folks to get that fixed. Uh, so your offices are a very sensitive environment uh, with, with pretty much a zero tolerance threshold of, of pests. Um, there's important standards and regulations that not all offices will be held to the same standards and regulations, but all of them have, have things in place for maintaining a pest-free environment or having preventative control strategies in place that that you can document and show to a potential auditor that, that covers that you, you've met their standard. Um, but ultimately, pest management matters most because of the reputation and the effect that pests can have on your bottom line. If you're a dental office and someone's sitting in the chair and, and a mouse runs by, um, that, you know, in this day and age with, with social media and online reviews, uh, that that can that can spread like wildfire, or or you're you're a you know a family practicing a family practice office, and you've got bed bugs that have that have been spotted in your waiting room. Before that person even makes it to the first uh, you know inspection room, they might have even tweeted that hey I just saw bed bugs on the chair in this area at this place. So um, the reputation and and damage there too, and and having a program in place where even if you do have an isolated incident like that. You can say we have a plan in place. You know, you you have all the documentation. You have the firepower behind your response to that statement, and you and it actually means something when you say, uh, "In incidents, incidents can happen." We have a plan in place. We have a program in place, and a pest management cooperation or an integrated pest management program in place to take care of these incidences when they do happen. So I just use that term, integrated pest management. That's what IPM stands for. So, so what is IPM? It's integrated pest management. It's an all-inclusive, this is the, the, the long definition, an all-inclusive ongoing proactive cycle of three critical activities focused on prevention of pests. So you first need to assess the pest or assess the situation through, an, through a thorough inspection. Um, this would obviously start with an identification of what type of pest you're dealing with. If, if someone sees a, you know, what would be a, a plant feeding bug that came in off of a, a tree or a bush outside and, and came in through an open doorway and says, oh, I think I saw a bed bug, and, and you have a plan in place to collect it and we can identify it, um, that's going to be the first step in integrated pest management is actually understanding what we're dealing with. So we've, we've performed an inspection, we've assessed the situation, we've confirmed what we're dealing with with an ID. And I mean, you guys can already see where we're going to get into cooperation and how both sides of this equation, you guys as the, the medical office, uh, you're the healthcare office management staff or, or team, and then your pest control provider, you guys have to be cooperating. You have to be on the same page at all times with how you're going to deal with either a pest incident or how you're going to deal with knowing what your IPM plan is or how you're going to manage or prevent pests from actually you know, infesting or, or being introduced even into your facility. So the second step after you've assessed and you know what you're dealing with, you're going to implement control measures. And, and the whole point of IPM is to rely on non-chemical control measures first. You have to exhaust everything you can do. Uh, that could be cultural control. That's, that's something as simple as behaviors. Do employees prop a door open when they go outside to sit on a break? Is that a pest entry point? You bet it is. What kind of behavior can we change? What kind of, you know, do we throw the trash out? Is, is the dumpster located very close to, to the exterior door where, where a fly could maybe come in? Simple behavior, cultural measures like that. Or, or you can also have physical non-chemical measures. These could be screens on windows, uh, fans to help dry out sensitive areas that have been mopped and cleaned faster so you don't have a potential moisture source, you know, something like that. Traps, monitors, those are going to be physical or mechanical control measures that are going to be in place. Um, insect light traps are, are, are a key thing that you should have around entry points 
so that anything that actually does fly in, I mean, you can't always have your doors closed. So you, you want to have things like that, like a light trap that has a sticky board on it, that basically anything that does fly in, you're going to catch it. Um, and that, that brings us to monitoring the effectiveness of the program. All of these things that we've combined together, so from identifying a problem, figuring out what it is and where it potentially could have come from, implementing non-chemical control measures first, and then if we have to, we use a chemical. But it's, you know, the goal of an IPM program is to reduce the amount of times you actually need to apply chemical or apply product in, in an environment, especially in something as sensitive as, as, an, as, a, as a, you know, an inspection room or, or a, a office suite there at, at your office where, where, you know, your patients are going to be in, you know, have, have procedures done potentially or, or even just, you know, do the general walkthrough of, of figuring out what's wrong with them. Those are highly sensitive areas. So what are some of those elements of that successful plan? We've touched on a couple of these. It has to be environmentally considerate. So you have to exhaust those non-chemical control measures first. You have to have a hard look at, at your landscaping sometimes, or, or even, you know, people don't think about it, but the roof of, of your structure. You know, what is the roof of your structure and how does that impact what's happening down below? Well, if, if water's pooling up there, you could have mosquitoes or, or, or pests like that that are hovering around nearby, near entry points and actually coming in your facility. Or how is water draining away? If, you know, water is going to be a very uh, attractive source to pests and, and it could actually come in. So you need to have all of those tools in place to manage pests before you even try a chemical. So IPM, a successful plan, like I mentioned, involves your entire staff. So every, every aspect of your facility needs to understand that you have a plan in place and needs to understand the procedures involved with that. So is there a, a standard operating procedure when a, when a pest is found in a waiting room? Well, if not, you need to work with your pest management provider to, to help create one that, you know, what's the communication strategy moving forward from the moment someone thinks they find one to the moment we actually resolve the problem. So getting everyone on board with your plan and understanding that cooperation with your pest management provider is key. Detailed records of the plan must be kept. Um, this is where you should be relying on your pest management provider. Um, and I already touched on integrating that, the vendor with the staff. It needs to address all those hotspots. You've got to make sure, you know, routinely look and review uh, the inspection reports because your pest management provider should be telling you anywhere where, hey, you, you, your screen's missing here, or you, you've, you've got a gap in your door sweep here that could potentially be letting things in. Those should all be being addressed routinely on your routine service visits by your pest management provider, and those should be being reported back to you. So what are some of these pests? What are the hot pests right now in, in, in office areas? And then what are their hot spots that they would like to go to, and, and how do you know they're there? So we've touched on a few of these. Common areas, waiting rooms, those are going to be ones where pests can actually come in on the people that are coming to your office. Um, you know, someone brought that in or a common area where something could fly in or come in through a door. A waiting room where, where lots of people aggregate. Those are going to be very common spots where, where someone's actually brought a hitchhiking pest in with them. Then you get to things like restrooms. And those are just, there's high moisture areas in there. Uh, there's potential harborage for pests. Those are, are common spots where a pest might not be living in your restroom, but that's where it's going to get water, and then it's going back to where it is living. So people often see a pest in a restroom, even though it's not living in there. Then you get back to some of those pest hotspots that rather than your patients that are coming in, you're getting to the ones that are completely your control and on your employee's side. These could be waiting, or I mean break rooms or places where employees are storing food. Um, if there's a fridge in a break room where food's being stored, there's a great chance that there could be pests trying to get in there or, you know, crumbs or, or anything like that. Sanitation around food storage areas is, is, is of utmost importance. How, storage areas where you're storing supplies, depends on what you're storing, or, or even a storage area for a janitorial closet. I mean, mops that aren't correctly hung are, are a surefire way to eventually have yourself a nice small fly problem or a, a fruit fly or a a dark-eyed fruit fly problem where you have you have little little flies all of a sudden buzzing around. Um, 
you know, and then of course you have your waste disposal areas. So this is going to be how are we handling trash? Where's our trash going? How frequently are we cleaning out our dumpster? How frequently are we rotating our dumpster? You know, knowing and understanding the the protocol of your of your your trash company is 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 almost just as important as how you know how tightly you tie the bags of trash or how are you sealing up bags of trash to keep pets out. So there's a lot of different hot spots around your area. And then, you know, what are some signs of some of those pests? So if you're talking about a pest like bed bugs, you're, you could either see live or dead bed bugs. Um, if a bed bugs come in on someone, you can see one there, a fully engorged bed bug right there, full of blood. So they like to greatly overfeed right there. You can see the abdomen extremely swollen um, with, with human blood. So they, they, they kind of like, they're kind of like me when I go to the buffet. I eat too much and then I come home and I kind of feel sick. But if, if a bed bug hitchhikes in with someone, they're actually going to, you know, that person sits down in the waiting room or, or sits down or lays down on a on a examination table. Um, that bed bug might crawl off them and then it immediately wants to go somewhere into a crack and crevice nearby. So say the underside of the seat or there's plenty of cracks and crevices on an exam table, um, but then it'll actually puke out some of that blood. So you'll see those rust colored stains from that blood, that blood puke, you could say. Um, and those are a, an easy sign to detect. You might not see the actual bed bug, but if you start seeing a lot of signs like that, you know that, that you know, you may have just had a patient that came in. Uh, you may or may not have a bed bug. You had a patient that came in with bed bugs, and then you may or may not still have bed bugs on your table or in your waiting room. So it's a, it's a sign that you need to get a hold of someone. Uh, like your pest management provider for them to come and do a more thorough inspection. Um, flies, you're going to see things such as maggots or adult flies near the garbage or drains. Or as I mentioned, you know, one of the one of the another sure surefire spot for fungus gnats is if if your employees have live plants or you actually have live plants, uh, you know, in your entryways or or any sort of um, vegetation like that that is inside your facility and it's being overwatered and fungus is actually growing in that dirt that the plants are growing in. You could have fungus gnats emerging from those potted plants. So actually seeing the organisms. Um, ants, ants, the ants that you see crawling around, I mean, it, it's hard if the moment you pour a concrete slab and put a structure on it, you've essentially created something for ants to live underneath. They would love, they love living underneath that concrete slab. If there's any crack in that slab, the ants can come right up through the slab and into your structure. Uh, oftentimes you'll see wing forms of the ants. Those are kind of reproductive. The ones that you see walking around the street every day, those are worker ants. Um, if you see winged ants, those are ones that are trying to start a new colony. And that generally means you've had ants underneath your structure for about five years. And they've just been flourishing to the point where they actually are now creating ones with wings that are trying to start their own new colony. Um, Rodents, I mean, this could be rats, this could be Norway rats that live in the ground in burrows, or it could be roof rats that live up in the trees or, or you know, in vegetation or on the roof of your structure, um, or it could be mice. I mean, mice are actually way more common inside structures than, than rats are, um, but, but either one are going to produce those, you know, you know droppings, so you'll see their, their excrement, their poop. Um, you'll see gnaw marks, they'll actually chew through door sweeps and, and things like that. And then you'll also see where, where things are coming or, you know, where they're running inside your structure because they have this grease on their fur that actually creates a little trail, a visible trail of grease that you can see as they're moving around. Uh, one of the biggest things that we get the most calls about um, for <clears throat> medical office facilities are going to be spiders. I mean, spiders are very common and they're very healthy to have outside. They're actually predators of other bugs. So when, you know, we actually, you know, wouldn't necessarily want to treat for spiders because they're doing their thing. So get, keeping spiders outside is, is of utmost importance. But, I mean, we will treat for spiders around around a structure, but, you know, it, it's with a grain of salt. So, but oftentimes when spiders get in, they're found in room corners, storage areas, near windows. You'll see that webbing. I mean, some of the some of the worst stories I have about, about spider infestations were actually at a, at a hospital up in, in Connecticut where their maternity ward, they, they, they hadn't sealed the windows properly from the outside and spiders were actually crawling in the maternity ward. Um, and that was quite disturbing to those patients that, that you know, just had, had newborn babies and then there's spiders crawling through the windows. Um, so 
they, they will come through. And as I mentioned, you're really going to want to exclude those. Uh, you'll see the spiders themselves, egg sacs, the webs. Uh, you'll see dead bugs. So they, they kind of just chew a bug in half. And if you see a bunch of dead bugs in your storage closet that are all chewed up, most likely you got a spider or, or some other type of bug like a centipede that's actually a very good predator of insects inside your structure. So, so what are our, how do we take care of these things? How do we, we talked about IPM being a preventative plan of attack. So how do we prevent these things? You know, we can't stop someone from bringing in a bed bug, but how do we create a program that prevents these or how do we know we're gonna respond in the best way possible for each of these situations, or or how do we prevent flies from from coming inside, or or rodents? So that that's the key to IPM, and and that first step was inspection. So with your pest management company, you need to establish their what interval they're going to come. So how frequently do they need to come to respond to the issues that you're having routinely? So determine when, where, and how frequently they're going to you know when they're going to come first of all, where they're going to go when they get there. And then at what frequency do they need to hit every one of these sensitive areas every time and inspect? Um, and then pay a special attention to those hot spots, those, those areas that we hit. They should be hitting those spots. I mean, you can't get to every examination room every time, though. That's the thing. There's, there's people you're, you're potentially in business. You can't inspect every exam room every time. So is there some frequency at which they could, they could inspect all of those exam rooms? Or do they need to come at a different time? So one visit, they, they, they'll need to come once a month. They'll need to come at a different time than they generally would when your hours are, when, when, the, when the operation is open, so to say, to hit all of those exam rooms. Um, with your pest management provider, you need to set action thresholds. So is there an action threshold? The action threshold is the pest population at which the pest presence is a nuisance, health hazard, or economic threat. So any one of the pests that we were talking about today, uh, it fits all of these bills. Ants could be a nuisance and a health hazard. They're, they live in soil. They could be bringing microbes up from the soil that that most likely aren't pathogenic, but they're still bringing, you know, they could still be contaminating a surface just by crawling on top of it. Um, things like bed bugs, they're an economic threat to you. If you have bed bugs in your waiting room, that, that social media thing is going to hurt your pocketbook. Um, rodents, a health hazard, again, you know, mice and rats uh, spread numerous diseases. Um, so, and, and flies, I mean, it's been re recent research has shown that one house fly actually contains about 10,000, you know, the average house fly contains about 10,000 different, path path you know, potential pathogenic bacteria on, on just one fly. I mean, if you think about what flies actually land in, they're, they're actually laying eggs in that rotting, you know, rotting trash or, or even species outside of other animals because that's what those maggots are actually eating and then that adult fly has now come inside your your office facility so it, it's hard to find an, a more common health hazard than a, than an actual you know common house fly um, but so setting these action thresholds is there really a threshold in your environment or is the threshold zero um, so oftentimes the threshold is zero but, but knowing, hey, we, we, you know, is there a different response to say a bed bug or a fly or ants? Ants might be, you might be able to live with until, hey, the next time our pest management guy comes in, if they were coming in a, you know, your entry area. It, it also, the action threshold depends on, on if it's an exam room versus, versus the entry point versus the waiting room. That's something you need to work those thresholds out with, with, with your pest management provider. Um, but whatever threshold you set, these are critical in guiding those decisions that you make. Uh, requirements or guidelines set by regulatory agencies often, you know, need to be taken into consideration. And oftentimes, they'll want these thresholds documented. So you need to say the threshold is one bed bug, the threshold is one fly, and you'll need to document what area that's for versus 10 ants, 20 ants in an entryway, 100 ants in an entryway might be the threshold when, when you actually need to do something versus one ant in an exam room means you need to get your pest control guy out there every time. So, so what are some tips for, for actually preventing these things? Um, bed, bugs are, bed bugs are the hottest topic right now. Uh, it doesn't matter which industry you're talking about as it relates to pest management. Everyone is talking about bed bugs because they're everywhere again. 
Um, you know, in the early 2000s, we started seeing a resurgence in bed bugs. Um, they are, they're showing no signs of slowing down. It's almost like, you know, people that, pe people that grew up in the 1940s, 50s, they lived with bed bugs in their life. And then we had a whole entire two generations of humans, or Americans, that didn't have them. So we've almost forgot uh, what to look for or, or how to know you even have bed bugs. And, and it's really a slow process to get this back in people's heads that, that here's what you should do. And, and there's nothing wrong with having them, but you need to stop the infestation from growing and growing and growing and growing. Um, in your office environment, it's a little different than someone's home or, or a hotel, but you constantly have a, a different group of people coming in every day that could potentially be bringing them with them. So how do you prevent it? You, you have routine, thorough inspections. So if, if this is something where, you know, the pest control guy needs to get in a half hour before you open because you want those, you want every chair flipped over and inspected for signs of bed bugs before you open, you know, once a week, um, that's something that your program could outline. Um, you need to have, you know, we talked earlier about that cooperation. Your employees need to be known, need to know those spots that we talked about or how you would know you have bed bugs. And they need to know the procedure for reporting signs of them. So having training, you know, potential training on bed bugs with your pest management provider, have them come in and train your folks. I mean, I routinely have gone to, to facilities and trained in shifts where I actually hit, you know, if it was a, a elderly retirement care center, I've hit the night training staff and then I stay and I hit the morning training staff and then I come back later in the day and hit the daytime training staff. So you need everybody that's on your staff trained in these things. You have to have a response protocol in place. Other, other pests, um, you know, you can work with your pest management provider. Bed bugs are one right now where the response needs to be defined and it needs to be immediate. Um, you need to know which areas you can quarantine and which ones you can't. If, if someone comes in, comes up to your, to your receptionist desk and says, um, I think I saw a bed bug here. Are you really able, you know, from the waiting area, are you really able to quarantine that area during the day? No, you, you might not be able to. Um, you, you might need to have someone trained there on response or get your pest management provider out there to quickly assess the situation, you know, potentially physically remove the bed bug if there is one with a vacuum or another tool like that, a non-chemical tool, and then, you know, then have a procedure in place for what will happen later in the day once the facility closes, you know, a further inspection or potential treatment if necessary at that point. Um, it's never a good idea to self-treat um, products that are effective at, at, at actually getting rid of bed bugs are, are labeled by the environmental, you know, labeled by the, you know, by the EPA with a label with application procedures and, you know, precautionary statements for how to protect environmental health and protect people after they're applied. So never try to self-treat a room for bed bugs. Um, oftentimes the over-the-counter products just make them spread or go back further into a, a crack or a crevice where they could potentially, you know, remain for an extended period of time. So flies, we talked about sanitation. Flies are, are really a sanitation pest. Um, they are they are pretty much the biggest health threat for your environment. Um, it all relies on how you're moving, moving or throwing away, storing waste, and then how often it's removed from your area. Uh, prevention tips could include air curtains. Uh, so an air curtain is a, the door, you open a door uh, from the inside, there's a, a fan that directionally blows down that would knock a fly down and deter it from actually coming through an open door. Um, air curtains can be expensive, and they're only as good as the integrity of the curtain. So you need to, if you do have air curtains right now at your facility, you should definitely be having someone out from the manufacturer of those curtains at least twice a year to maintain that the air is coming out at the correct speed and at the correct direction or, or angle. Because if either of those things are off, a fly will just fly right underneath your air curtain, and you have a very expensive mistake on your hands. Um, working with your pest management provider to put in light traps. Like I said, if, if a fly comes in, there's UV light traps that have a glue board on them that you can position. You just need to know how to position those correctly so you're not drawing things in or towards your doors at night. So that way, when that employee comes first thing in the morning, they're not opening the door and there's tons of bugs right there around your door. So you need to make sure you're not pulling things in 
with your light traps. And then just installing weather strips and, and having good building integrity around there is, is a good way to prevent flies from coming around. Ants, like I said, they love to live underneath those foundations. So if you have cracks or openings in the walls of your foundation, uh, your pest management provider should be finding those for you on an inspection report and either sealing them with caulk themselves or working with your facility staff or your building management owner to, to find a way to, to rectify that and, and stop the ants from coming in. Something as simple as caulking windows oftentimes keeps flies out, keeps ants out, uh, keeps a lot of different pests out. So you need to remove those food sources. Uh, you know, I've gone into numerous break rooms where the floor looks clean, but you pull out the, the fridge or you pull out the microwave off the counter and there's just tons of food underneath it. So you need to make sure you have routine cleaning procedures or make sure you're working with your janitorial staff to make sure that everything is cleaned, not just the surfaces that you can see, but what lies beneath, what lies behind. Ants will find food and they would prefer food where a food source where you don't see them. Um, you know, you can use sticky traps to monitor for these things. Ants will get caught on a simple glue board. Um, if your pest management provider's coming around at some, some level of frequency, they'll see this. They might even be able to locate the food source or find that trail of ants and get to the source of the problem, which is actually where are those ants nesting? That's what you, the ones that, killing the ones that are coming and, and feeding in your facility, that's not gonna solve your problem. You really need to get to that colony, that nest of where those ants are. Uh, rodents, this is gonna be the other big, big true disease spreading pest that could be coming around your facility. Um, you need to line and cover trash cans because they're constantly looking for a food source. Um, mice technically only need food. They can get all the water they need from their food source generally. Um, rats need both food and water every day. Um, so you're gonna wanna clean and rotate dumpsters and keep those dumpsters or where you're storing, especially food trash or anything that comes from your, from your break room area you're gonna to wanna to store that as far away from the facility as possible to keep as much distance potentially from where rodents might be attracted to. Uh, if there's clutter, even if it's not your clutter, if there's clutter on the side or near the building, uh, on the exterior of your building or anywhere near one of your exterior doors, if you're in a shared plaza, make sure you talk with the facility management about that because that clutter is nothing but harborage for exterior rodents. That could be house mice, that could be deer mice, that could be rats i mean anything like that that is gonna if you're offering them a harborage or a protection um outside especially they love that and they will burrow and build a nest right there on the ground level and they'll be foraging all along the side of the building there and they'll be looking for ways in as i mentioned earlier if, if a rodent knows there's a food source inside they'll actually chew through things so they'll chew their way in um, it's often said, you know, a mouse needs a hole about the size of a dime to get through and a rat needs a hole the size of a quarter to get inside your structure. Um, they really need that hole just to get their head started and get their head in there. Then they'll chew it and widen it up a little bit and they'll squeeze their body through. Um, a, a good preventative tip is to, to check the vegetation and make sure there's not vegetation coming right up next to your, your structure. This is also good for um, you know, just ground crawling insects that might be coming around because you, you keep the vegetation a good foot, two feet away from your building. Uh, a gravel strip or uh, a particulate rock around there is really good for rodents, especially burrowing rodents like rats because they don't like to dig down through the rocks. They would rather dig right through soil and build a, a, a you know, a nest or a, a, a burrow right there in the soil. So having that rock around there is really good for rodents. Um, spiders, like I said earlier, you're going to want to seal those gaps openings. Another one that just simply cocking around windows and keeping windows and doors closed and properly sealed really takes, uh, really takes, uh, you know, a good chunk of the spiders and keeps them outside. Um, foundation walls. Um, uh, spiders are really an inspection pest. Um, your pest management provider should be knocking down any visible spider webs on any service, even if there's a spider there or not. Uh, just removing those webs because if you've killed the spider, if, if you killed the spider and there's a web up there, another spider will come and either eat that web because it, it feels like it's a good place to live, or some spiders will even reuse webs from other spiders. So, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, you know, the goal of this is a pest management program. All of these other preventative measures and all these things that we can do before chemicals is the, the, the crux of what IPM truly is. You need to do 
all of the preventative measures you can before actually using any chemical application. So if everything else is ineffective, then we should come in and say, okay, we can apply chemicals. Uh, we should only use those in targeted areas. They should be defined which chemicals you can use in which areas of your facility as a last resort. I mean, you know, you should be, you should always favor, or your pest management provider should always favor baits or containerized products that can be removed so they leave no residue behind. Um, you know, baits and things like that should be tr targeted first. Um, and those are also often tamper proof resistant things. So if there's, you know, children and you've applied an ant bait inside a container, the child that, uh, that might be nearby or walking in that entryway can't get inside that. So it, it really eliminates any non-target, you know, I'm using humans as a non-target term. That's, that's almost scary, but using, you know, that potential for exposure when you actually do have to use a product, uh, containerized bait is, is often the best way to go. Um, so that's that impact on the environment. And, you know, you need to have a conversation with your pest management provider and make sure they're, they understand. If you ask them, you know, hey, can I get the EPA label for that product you use? If they can't get that for you right there or get you to a, you know, a database or a website of some sort that has those immediately on hand, that's an issue. And, and you might need to, you know, make sure that you, you, you can get access to any products at any time, whether that be the label or the SDS, the safety data sheet for that product. So ensure that you have access to those documents. Um, remember, this is a team effort. Um, everyone there on your staff needs to understand. I mean, we all think we come to work and, and we're doing our job and, and pest management isn't, isn't my job. My job is, is reception or my job is, you know, running this x-ray or, or, or doing this or that. Um, but everyone has a role in pest management because everyone is, is caring about the, you know, the business and your customers. I mean, their customers, your patients' health is, is the first most important and protecting the environment when they come to get help is, is your job too. And just like it's your pest management guy's job. So there has to be that team effort. There has to be that cooperation and there has to be that communication and understanding on both sides. Um, any, any Orkin will come and give complimentary staff training. Um, if, if you have another pest control provider currently, ask them, they should be able to come. And even if you already have an IPM plan in place and you have SOPs in place for how you're dealing with pests in your office environment, it's always good to have an annual review of those in case you've brought new employees on or just to remind those older employees, hey, you know, what? What, what, let's focus this year on, on two pests. Let's talk about rodents and flies. Or, you know, let's have a bed bug specific one halfway through the year and do the other pests or, you know, cockroaches the next, the next time. Or you can, you know, quarterly, I'm, I'm, your pest management provider will work with you to, to, to train your staff as frequently as you would like, I'm sure, to help make sure everyone is, is part of this team and part of this understanding that, that pest management is, is really a, a whole program and maintaining that pest-free environment isn't just something where you can come in and spray, and, you know, they used, to, they used to use the term pray and spray in our industry, and or I mean spray and pray, because you'd spray and then you'd pray that it would work. Um, those days are gone, and, and now it, it, we're, we're moving on to a, a much more environmentally, environmentally friendly program. So documentation, your pest management provider should be providing you with documentation Anytime you would like, you should be able to access this information anytime you would like. Um, it should track the effectiveness of your program. So you've gone and we've implemented all these non-chemical control tools. Uh, we ended up having to put out, you know, a rodent bait outside. Um, you should be able to document from the records that your pest control company is keeping of each service visit how well or you know you should be able to monitor how well those control strategies are working. So you had you had a presence of a rodent outside, you put bait out. Um, they ate the bait, you then put out a non-toxic uh, bait block after that, and the feeding stopped. So you've documented that you took care of the problem, and you've gone back to a non-chemical control monitoring strategy to show that you're, you're, you're continuing this, you know, this program of, of inspection and monitoring and working the program. But you should be able to figure all of that information out by the records that your pest control company is giving you or any trending. So you should be able, if they have light traps near doorways or in sensitive areas of your facility, they should be 
not only counting how many bugs are on those traps at, at, a, at a regular interval, but it giving you some level of detail. So is it flies? Was it moths? Was it mosquitoes? What were they finding on those things? And you should be able to track those trends over time. So if you, if you have a quarterly meeting, you can review pest trends or what, what exactly on the big picture are you seeing? And, you know, what if, if you have the same problem every year, what can you be doing before you actually have the problem next year to, to say, not have mosquitoes around your facility? Or, you know, what, what, why are we having flies every, every May through August? Is there something else that we can be doing January through June, or, you know, January through April that will help reduce this huge surge of flies. So those are the things that you should be able to figure out from trending reports um, that allow you to make your pesticide program better. And that all centers around that communication with your pest management provider. Um, your documentation should meet the Joint Commission accreditation requirements. Um, if you have ORCIN right now, it currently does. Review those re requirements with your provider. Make sure they're getting you everything you have. Um, and it allows you, the important thing here is you can track and, re and look at the history for any pesticide applications, and you need to know those locations of where those took place. Um, a list here, this is just a list. Um, this, this webinar, like I said, is going to be available to, to any of you that are attending today, or it will be available on the PACOM uh, YouTube channel in the near future. So you, you don't necessarily need to remember all these things, but all of these things are important. And anytime if you are actually audited, with reference to pest management, they're going to be looking for these exact pieces of information about every pesticide application. So dates of service, what were you actually, what was your target pest? Why were you actually applying something? What conducive conditions? What other corrective actions have you put out? So all of those non-chemical control measures need to be referenced somewhere in documentation related to this incident. Um, so bait, trap maps, so where, where exactly are all of our devices, where are all of our products and equipment at related to your facility, uh, treatment data, and then, of course, where those treatments took place. Um, I know we've, we've kind of come through quickly on this on IPM, but I did want to leave here a good, you know, 10 minutes for questions at the end, but you can always get more information on integrated pest management. Uh, you can follow Orkin on LinkedIn. OrkinCommercial.com. There's all kinds of free educational materials, tips, uh, tricks of the trade, uh, pest-specific guidelines and manuals for, for how you can shore up, you know, whether it be the exterior facility to make it less conducive to, to, to something like birds even. We didn't even talk about birds today, but birds just popped in my mind right there. So how do I make my place less attractive to pigeons? That, there's information on our website, so feel free to check that out. Um, with that, I'm going to pull back up my, my chat feature here. Not sure if any of you have had questions or, or have further questions, um, but I would love to take any of them you got. Okay. Um, it appears we have a couple questions that have come in. Um, if you find bed bugs, what needs to be thrown away immediately? Um, that is a, a, a good question. Um, so it depends on where, where you find the bed bugs. Um, if they're on a chair or, or, or something like that, really very few things have to actually be thrown away because we're dealing in this office environment, we're dealing with what we call an introduction. Very rarely, you know, you won't have an, an introduction is one bed bug, let's say, and then an infestation is when you have every life stage of bed bugs and they're actually reproducing, laying eggs, feeding on blood meals, uh, you know, feeding on humans, um, and they have, con they have a constant host source, and this is that. We're dealing with, hey, it was an introduction. They brought in one bed bug, maybe two bed bugs. We found them. We've taken care of them. We've inspected everything else. So if it's on a chair, you're not going to need to throw that chair away. We can come in. We can use steam. We can use um, non-residual products like something that's alcohol-based at night when no one is there so that the odor dissipates by the time anyone's there and, you know, have proper ventilation. We can use products that you don't actually need to throw away chairs or exam tables or, or, or this or that. So, so very few things actually need to be thrown away. If it's, if it's on clothing, a washer and a dryer kills all stages of the bed bug. So when you're drying something on high heat, you, you can essentially wash it and you might wash off the bed bug and it'll just get washed down the drain of your, of your washer. 
with, with the water. If it clings onto your clothes, you throw it in the dryer, uh, high heat, and it'll kill any stage of the bed bug that's still in those clothing. So they also make um, containerized little heat boxes, electric heat boxes that you can put items in. So we have boxes of different sizes that just run on a, on a standard 110 volt plug. You can plug those in. I mean, we, we routinely sell those to customers so they can have them on site to heat treat any of these items that, that may be too big yeah, or, you know, might, might need, you know, we're worried that there's bugs in there. If you can actually heat it up, you can actually get rid of the bugs that way. So to answer that question, very few things need to be thrown away immediately. It's much more important that we have a plan in place for how we're going to deal with the situation. So don't rush to throw anything away. Oftentimes when you throw something away, you'll actually take it and you'll move the bed bug to another part of your facility. So keep things in place. Uh, don't overreact. Let's have a plan in place for how we're going to deal with this. So another question that came in, are there any other bugs that look like bed bugs? And uh, yeah, um, especially to someone that's not an entomologist, there's a lot of bugs that look like bed bugs. Uh, most common is going to be a carpet beetle. So this is a type of beetle where it's actually the larva of the beetle looks like a bed bug. So, you know, a beetle as a larva looks nothing like the beetle as an adult, but they actually feed on carpets. They're, they're very common. They're, they're found throughout the country. Um, everywhere, there's multiple different types of carpet beetle, but they actually feed on fiber and on, so they'll be, they could be around your bed at home or they could be in your facility if you have carpet in exam rooms or, or rugs or things of that nature. Carpet beetles are, are very common and the larva actually does look a lot like a bed bug. Um, so that's one that, that could be in your facility that would routinely be misidentified as a bed bug. Other than that, you, yeah, I mean, if you're a medical office facility or a healthcare office, you could have someone come in with head lice. Head lice, especially when they're full of blood, they're a parasite just like bed bugs, do look somewhat like bed bugs. Head lice are obligately tied to their host, though, so they're always going to be attached to that hair or that follicle. So they have big old claws on their legs. So um, they don't necessarily look like that. Ticks, um, especially young ticks. Uh, the ones, because ticks, when they're young, often have six legs. As an adult, they have eight legs. Um, so ticks are another one that are routinely misidentified as, as bed bugs. But uh, ticks not, are, are nothing to be taken lightly. They're, they are of medical importance often. Um, so even, even if you have a tick, that, that might be something worth understanding and, and knowing what you would do uh, or how you would manage that with your pest management provider. Let's see here. Next question. All right, with the season about to change, is there anything special we should be doing to prepare? Um, yeah, so we're, we're kind of ending summer and, and, and right now summer means peak activity, um, pests love hot, humid areas. So right now, most pests, including rodents or anything like that, they're very happy outside. As we move into the fall, now is the time when you should be really working with those, with, you know, if, if you're, you should be scheduling, if it's not part of your general pest control service, you should be scheduling an exterior inspection or even a roof inspection so your pest management provider can, can look through and, and look at, you know, any potential openings or gaps that you have in place because come fall, depending on where you are, I mean, you know, we're getting towards uh, up north, uh, the end of September, you're, you're, Temperatures are already starting to cool down, so in the south a little later than that. But um, as we get to fall, things will try to come into your facility, and and that's the time where you should you should really be shoring up right now, um, especially with an emphasis of focus on rodents and and how rodents might get in. Um, so so schedule a, an inspection with your pest management provider, and um, and have them have them look at uh, look at look at potential areas where they could come in. Uh, another question I get all the time is, is, you know, should should my pest management provider be consulted when when I'm going to do, you know, we're we're thinking about adding in a new doorway here, or or you know, we're adding on to to a facility, or there's construction in my facility. Should my pest management provider be consulted to at least provide insight of steps that I should take before that happens? And the answer is 100% yes. 
every time. So anytime you're changing or modifying the exterior of your facility, especially if you're adding an entry point, talk to your pest management provider beforehand. They'll outline steps you can do to make the areas around that place safe or you know more likely to not be infested by by exterior pests coming in and then certainly they could give you tips on hey well if you have an outlet here make sure you run electricity here so that way i can put a light trap in here if there's going to be a door there simple things like that um that that you might not be thinking about or your your facility manager or owner might not be thinking about when they're actually just worried about knocking down a wall and putting in you know, a new HVAC vent or, or, or something of that nature. If they're just cutting a hole in a wall, you don't want things having a free reign to come into your facility. Looks like we got time for a few more questions here. So if anybody out there has questions, please, please chat them in right now. Um, The next question would be, can you outline the steps included in a pest siting protocol? Um, well, that, that, once again, that's going to be very specific uh, to, um, to your facility and your pest management provider. You should work with them. Uh, bottom line, you want to have, you know, is the expectation that you try to collect the specimen or not collect the specimen? If you're going to collect the, if you're going to collect the bug that you've, you've seen, how are you going to do that? You need to have folks trained as, is tape the best way or should you go get a, a glue board or is the expectation that you just say you saw it, you define the area where you saw it, you define the time you saw it, and then you, you section off the room. Um, there, there's different things that you can do to actually get the pest. What number are they gonna call? Who are they gonna call after it? If, if everyone's not known or it's not posted or it's not written down in a procedure that after you've seen a pest, you need to call this number. Uh, you need to set the expectation with your pest management provider of how 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 quickly they'll come. So, you know, sometimes if it's an overnight thing, they could come the next morning. If they, if it's day of business, you might have it negotiated in an agreement that they're there in four hours. That all needs to be defined as part of the pest siting protocol. Um, and then, you know, who's the point of contact that if if you're a if you're if you're a, a nurse practitioner and you see something. Who is your point of contact in the facility? Make sure every employee knows who their point of contact is or where their pest siting log is that they need to fill out. Because if they just go up and fill out a log um, and your pest guy doesn't come for, you know, he comes once a week and he was just there the day before and then he actually isn't coming till the following Friday. So now you're 10 days out before someone sees that. If, yeah, I saw ants in the entryway. Um, no, you should have another mechanism in there that, that helps you communicate that beyond just writing down what it was that you thought you saw or you saw a bug in this area at this time. Um, there needs to be some next level, especially in a sensitive environment like these healthcare offices, where we can, you know, have that communication and, and have the expectations set forth of what, what's going to happen. Um, I did mention birds. We had a uh, we had one one last question come in that says, hey, we're having issues with birds. Does Orkin have a bird service? Uh, you bet Orkin has a bird service. Um, there isn't a lot of products out there that we would use for birds. Mostly it's going to be about creating unfavorable conditions, so a lot of exclusion. If you have a sign up there, we can mesh off the sign or we can net off the sign or put spikes up that make that not an appropriate place for birds to nest. I mean, birds that, that let, that'll nest on a sign above a doorway They'll defecate down on the ground there, and then you have people tracking in bird feces, which is loaded with, with you know, pathogens and disease-causing agents like that, and they're tracking it through your carpets and this and that. So we do have an exclusion service generally, or we'll, we'll put up, you know, decoys, or, or there's lots of different tools that we have out there because, I mean, no, no one's really shooting birds or, or using a product to try and poison birds. So birds are something where you really have to change their behavior and kind of move them off to a, you know, show them that there's got to be another better place to live than on my sign or on my roof line if you're a bunch of pigeons or this or that. So you have to create unfavorable conditions that they don't like, and then they'll move on on their own. But we certainly have a bird service. If you're having an issue with birds, give us a call. So um, with that, um, if anyone else has any other questions, like I said, um, in about an hour, you'll get a an email with our uh, with the index number for you to go ahead and log in and or, or fill out 
what you need to get your CEUs of training credits for this. Um, the webinar will be available on the Paycom YouTube channel. I greatly appreciate all of you attending today and I hope it was beneficial and you've learned something. If there's any questions, my contact information is there on the screen. Uh, if you're not currently with Orkin, contact your pest management provider and have these discussions about IPM and its importance. And if there's anything they can do for you to help you with your program, I hope they do. So have a great day and uh, bye now.